Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome Becky Friedman. For those who were listening in, uh, we are alumni of the same school, Associated Hebrew School, where she is the director of operations now. I graduated and I moved on, but she's back in the school. And as you're going through her fifth cycle of chefs, um, but she also won, I believe, represented Canada in the international Kidon Hatanach. She's taught at Associated, but she's currently director of um, of operations there. She is a um, graduate of York University's Jewish Teachers Education Program, Mitreshet Lindenbaum. She's currently studying the Or Torah Stone International Halakha Scholars Program. That's the Lindenbaum Halakha Program, I assume, correct? And um, that's a uh, lot going. Okay. And it's a pleasure to welcome her back. I think this is her second time teaching for Torah Motion. So we want to welcome her and looking forward to her shear tonight. Vakasha. Thank you so much, Rabbi Kalman. I'm just going to open up my slideshow and then I will share my screen on it. Hang on. But maybe before I do that, I'll put the the link to the source sheet in the chat for anyone who wants. I can put the link in if you if it'll make it easier. It'll take me half a minute. I'll put in the link. Okay. And here is my slideshow. So I'm uh, speaking on my course this week is Parshat Kitisa. Uh, and in Kitisa, we get to read the other Ten Commandments. I know a few weeks ago we had Prashat Yitro with like the classic Ten Commandments, uh, but in Kitisa we're going to see uh, once again we get uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, so in Kitisa we're going to see we're going to see a set of Ten Commandments, uh, which might be a little bit different from what we're used to. Don't panic. I'm not throwing out the the original Ten or any part of the Torah, but but we're gonna we're gonna explore a different version of the Ten Commandments. Uh, so in Kitisa, uh, we see uh, first source on our source sheet. Um, uh, Moshe has now been up. This is at, uh, Kitisa. We, we've got Chata Egel, and then Moshe goes back up the Har Sinai to, uh, uh, to talk to Hashem about, to pray to Hashem for forgiveness for the Jewish people for this huge sin of the, the Chata Egel, the sin of the golden calf. That's a big problem. Uh, and Hashem says, okay, come back up the mountain. Stay there for 40 days and 40 nights with uh and you're gonna write down uh some commandments that I'm gonna tell you. And then near the end of this conversation, near, near the end of Moshe's second time on Har Sinai in Perak Lamadal, near the end of Parshat Kitisa. Uh if anybody wants to read source one, otherwise I'll find it while I'm looking at this. Okay. I know. Volunteering isn't so much fun. All right, so. Uh, our first source is Vahisha uh, Mim Hashem Rabbiim Yom Rabbiim Laila. Moshe was up there with Hashem forty days and forty nights. Lechem lo achal umayim lo shutai. Didn't eat. He didn't drink. Vayichtov al luchot at divrei haberit aseret hadevarim. And he writes on those on those luchot the words of the covenant. Divrei haberit. This is the covenant between. This is the contract. The covenant between the Jewish people and Hashem. He writes the aseret hadevarim. This is the first time in the Torah. That we see the phrase Aserat Devarim or Aserat Debrot, the Ten Commandments. This is the first time the Torah refers to something as the Ten Commandments. The ones we saw in Parashat Yitro, actually, we count them as ten. It never says that they're Ten Commandments. This is the first; they are called Ten Commandments later on in the Torah. But this is the first time the Torah says the Ten Commandments. So, what's the Torah calling the Ten Commandments? Let's check it out. Um, so, again, if we if we want to look at the source sheet. Uh, you can see what Kitisa calls the Torah Ten Commandments. And, Hold uh, on, if I can interrupt for half a second. When you say the source sheet, you mean the on Safari? Yeah, my Safari source sheet. Okay, because I don't think we posted that. We just posted okay. this. So, so um, I could probably post that in this chat box. I think it'll, it'll, it'll post directly. It's not coming from our, our website. Can I post it directly? Yeah, it should. Yeah, I can post directly. Okay, so let me do that while you go on. Yeah, it's just a little confusing because yeah. we have these nice Sorry. slides. Yeah. Let me get the Safari sheet and up. And okay. the slides I'm linking to the source sheet also. I can also click out to it. Um, that also works. Um, so we've got. I'm and I do want to preface that in the same way that we've got all different enumerations of all six hundred thirteen mitzvot, and there's differences of opinion between Judaism and other groups and how to enumerate the classic Aserat Debrot. There's flexibility in Perak Lamadal in chapter 34 of Shemot. How do we how do I actually enumerate these 10? This is how I divided it up. There, I'm sure there's other ways to enumerate the commandments that come before this line of Moshe wrote down these 10 commandments. This is a way that works, uh, but I'm sure there's other ways to, to enumerate these 10. So 
uh, on source source two, we've got the first of the Ten Commandments. Don't make molten gods. Don't make idols. Uh, and we've got uh, uh, keep the holiday of Chag of Pesach for seven days uh, in the month in the month of Aviv. Pesach's got to be at that right time of year. That's our second commandment. Third, we've got Kol Petar Recham Lev Achol Mikdechaz De Zachar Petar Chor Titzev Na Achol Bechor Nechat Titzev. We have to all firstborns belong to Hashem. Uh, then uh, I don't need to read on the sheet. Sheet Source five, we've got about Shabbat Uh Becharisha Bekatir Tishbot. Uh, commandment number six, we've got a reminder of the Shalosh Regalim Shalosh Pamim Bashanai Yer Echols Chorcha three times a year. All our males have to appear at the Beit Hamikdash. Uh, and source number seven, we don't uh, serve chametz on the mizbeach. Lo tizbech chametz dam We cannot sacrifice chametz on the mizbeach. As you see later on in Torah as well in Vayikra, with one notable exception. Uh, commandment number eight: There can be no leftovers of the korban pesach. Loyalin leboker zevach gapasach. Commandment number nine: That we bring our bikurim, we sheet bikurim matchata vi beit hashem lohacha. We bring our first fruits to the beit hamikdash. Uh, and number 10, a classic, don't cook a goat in its mother's milk, which we understand is we don't you have meat and milk together. Hang on. Any, anybody here feeling a disconnect between these and, and what we, we've come to know and love as the Ten Commandments? It's like a quick a quick show of hands. This is, this is the standard. This is the Ten Commandments, right? This, we, we all know the Ten Commandments. This, these are the Ten Commandments, yeah? Maybe, maybe, maybe not? Maybe not. Okay. Maybe not. So what happened here? Why why am I giving us this crazy Twilight Zone Ten Commandments that don't match up to what we recognize? This is what it says in chapter 34, leading up to that line that Moshe wrote out the Aserah to Devarim. But chapter 34, Moshe Shem tells Moshe these 10 rules. And then it says, Moshe Shem says, hey, Moshe, write this down. Uh, uh, it says, Tov lecha et ha-devarim. This is not the sheet, but uh, right before our first source, Hashem says, Tov lecha et ha-devarim Write for yourself all these things. Ha'ela, standard, usually in Tanakh, when it says Ha'ela, it means the things we just read, not some other disconnected things. He LP had to very Ma'ela because based on these things, Karati Tachabrit Vet Israel, I've made this covenant with you and the Jewish people. And then Moshe writes it down. It says the Yasser to Devarim. So what happens to what happened to the ones we know? What happened to the Yasser to Debrot? Um, well, the Aserah they brought, we know we're written on Luchot Habrit. So first, let's narrow down that question of what happened to the Aserah they brought with what happened to the Luchot Habrit that the Aserah they brought that we know and love were on. Because we know, well, we can we can track what happens. Let's follow the paper trail of the, the Luchot Habrit uh, on source, uh, now we're down to source 12 because I had all 10 commandments in there. Uh, source 12, if somebody wants to read about when we got the Luchot Habrit, I'm not seeing any. Number 12 is going to be on the other sheet. So it may be a little confusing for people okay. unless they. It's also, it's also it up here on the right, on the right hand side of the screen. Okay. Um, if anybody wants to read this, this source over here on the, on my right. Uh, don't all jump at once. Read. I'll just Please. look for it. Source 12. Source 12 or on the right hand side of the slide. Um. Okay, by Yitano Moshe, Kichalotala da Berito, Behav Sinai, Shne Luchot Haidu, Luchot Evan, Kituvim, Beetz Baelokim. Thank you. So this is the end of chapter 31. Uh, right before Moshe comes down the mountain the first time, right before we know dramatic irony, right before Chet Egel. But before, before all that, Hashem's been giving Moshe all these rules on Har Sinai. And then it says, when Hashem finished speaking with Moshe, Hashem gave Moshe the two Luchot Haidu, the two tablets, the two. Uh, the tablets of the Edu, tablets of the pact, tablets of the covenant, basically the contract between God and the Jewish people. Uh, these, they were written with the finger of God. These were written, these, the first two Tuluchot, which we know had the original Ten Commandments, were inscribed with the finger of God. Okay, great. Moshe's got the tablets. Follow the paper trail to source 13 or the left side of the screen. Anyone want to read where we last saw these two tablets? As soon as Moses came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, he became enraged, and he hurled the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. Thank you. Okay, so bad bad news about the Luchot Habrit, these 
beautiful tablets that God carved for us. Uh, Moshe sees Chet Egel, and the tablets don't even make it down the mountain in one piece uh, for whatever Moshe's reasons, which would be a whole other fascinating topic of its own. Uh, but whatever Moshe's reasons were, uh, he drops or throws the uh, tablets that God wrote, and they smash at the bottom of Har Sinai. So that's where our original Luchot Habrit uh, with the original Ten Commandments in Parshat Yitra are. They're lying in pieces at the bottom of the mountain. Okay, yeah, they get put away nicely afterwards. Uh, but they're, those Luchot are in pieces. So if we follow a little timeline here, uh, which I think is going to help uh, when, we, when we see why we get these new ones. So in Shmot chapter 20, Parshat Yitra, we get the Ten Commandments that we all know and love, you know, the the five between God and man, God and uh, God, uh, man, the five between man and man, you know, the, all the I'm God, don't covet, don't steal, and all that. We get those in chapter 20. At Har Sinai, God presents them like an author's reading of the book to the Jewish people. Uh, then uh, we've got a little uh, I've got a little interlude of of the some other some other laws in Parshat Mishpatim, and then Moshe goes out. They do some a ceremony at Har Sinai, and people agree to be in a this agreement with God. And then Moshe goes up to Har Sinai for the first ish time to get those luchot habrit, the the document of this of this special experience we've just had. And then Shmot Perak Lamed Bet, which we're now in Kitisa, we have Chet Egel, the sin of the golden calf. Big problem because, as we see and as we just read. When Moshe sees the golden calf, Moshe smashes the two tablets that had those original Ten Commandments on them in response in some way, whatever that that reason was or the reasoning for that response. In response to the golden calf, Moshe smashes the two tablets. Then, still in Kitisa, after Moshe smashes the tablets, 32, really 33 to 34, Moshe goes back up Har Sinai, seek forgiveness to people, and get replacement tablets. And then, while he's up there getting those replacement tablets, we read, like we just saw, these Ten Commandments, uh, that this this new weird version from Kitisa that don't match the Parsha Yitra version. And this timeline is going to help us, we might want to refer back to this, this timeline is going to help us understand why there's a difference. So, why do we have this change? Um, first of all, like I said, back in back in Parsha Yitra, we had an author's reading. Um, Parashat Yitro, it starts off chapter 20. It doesn't say Ten Commandments, but what it does say, it says, Vaydeber Elohim, et kol devrima elilimor. God spoke all these words, saying, and then it goes into the Ten Commandments from Parashat Yitro. So that's, first of all, an important difference, because what we get in Kitisa, that's not coming, I mean, it's coming from Hashem, it's coming from Hashem to Moshe, and Moshe's writing it down, and Moshe's going to teach it to Jewish people. We don't get any sort of national divine revelation in Kitisa. We already got that. We had our chance. That was Parashat Yitro. Um. So, see, checking. Uh, let's let's do a, a quick quick check on the original Ten Commandments. Um, and I've 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 marked out which are the positives and the negatives, the do's and the don'ts. So we've got. i um, read it all in long form. But basically, the controversial first one that other religions don't like counting as a commandment. I am Hashem. Basically, that's a positive. We've got to believe in Hashem. We've got to accept that Hashem is Hashem, that Hashem is the only God. Hashem is our God who took us out of Egypt and all that. Okay. Then we've got Lo Yelech Elohim Acharim that goes on to, well, it's got a few like sub-commandments there. You can't have any other gods. You can't make any idols. You can't make this kind of idol. You can't make that kind of idol. You can't make pictures of things to worship. You can't make pictures of things in the sky. You can't make pictures of things on land. You can't make pictures of things on under the, under the sea. So it's really, it's actually don't bow down to them, don't worship them. It's really like a whole bunch of X's, but we'll we'll summarize with one big X. That's a big a big don't there. We've got Lotisat Shem Hashem Don't swear falsely or by Hashem's name. Another don't. Now we've got Shabbat, which is a weird one because Shabbat is, is a as a do and a don't. And there's lots of places in, in Torah that refer to Shabbat in different ways, but right there in Parshat Yitra. We really have both. It says, It says, We start with remember Shabbat and keep it holy. That's a positive. But then it goes into, yeah, what do we mean by that? Six days we work. On the seventh day, You can't do work. Your kid can't do work. Your sons can't do work. Your daughters can't do work. Your slaves can't do work. Your maids can't do work. Your animals can't do work. Your neighbors can't do work. No, 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 no. So we'll get a whole string of X's that we'll summarize with one don't. So in a certainty brought in Parshat Isra, We've got a lot of a lot of don'ts there on the Shabbat as well as the do. And then we've got Kabedavicha Vadimecha. Honor your father and your mother. 
That's a do. It's positive. Treat your parents well. Um, and then the second half, it's all, it's another, a whole string of don'ts. Lot yitzach, don't murder. Lot enough, don't commit adultery. Lot ignov, don't steal. Lot never if I had chucker, don't bear a false witness against your neighbor. Uh, and then the last one again, it's actually a whole string of don'ts. Lot tachmod beit recha, lot tachmod esher recha, don't cover your neighbor's house. Lot don't cover your neighbor's wife. Don't cover your neighbor's slave or maid or cat, or donkey or not donkey or, or cow or, uh, yeah, cow or donkey, like anything. So it's really don't, 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 don't. Now, uh, as Rabbi Kelman mentioned, I've been working at Associated for a number of years. Um, now I'm now I'm not less in the educational side, but I was trained as a teacher. Um, and coming from an educational perspective, uh, there's a lot that's that's wrong, so to speak, with with these original Ten Commandments from an educational perspective. If I if I were a new teacher going into a class, I I I my teach, supervisors would tell me, hey, you better not put this up on the wall. Uh, because first of all, as a teacher, we're supposed to co-create our, our class rules with the students. This is okay, great, nice, beautiful author reading with God, but how do we know this is what the students want to hear? And second of all, uh, we were we are told as teachers, uh, when you're writing those class rules that you should really co-create with the students based on what's important to them, uh, you should be phrasing it as much as possible in positive language. Like a student of mine says, uh, don't get up when you're out of your seat when you're not supposed to. And I say, oh, good idea. Let's write that as stay in your seat. And they say, don't call out. And I say, good idea. Let's write that as wait until your hand, wait until your turn is called uh, to speak. Uh, it's it's a lot, uh, even when the kids phrase it like that, it's a lot easier to take. And as adults too, we often find it's a lot easier to take an instruction phrase in a positive language. Here's what you can do. Instead of don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. It's very hard to the don't, 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 don't. And these original Asterity brought, they're very heavy on the don'ts. We've got, counting this up, we've got five on this side, another two here, plus the Shabbat, this kind of half and half. We've got like seven and a half don'ts here, not counting all the sub-don'ts on some of these uh, multi-step commandments. Seven, seven and a half don'ts, two and a half do's, that's a bad balance. Uh, that I, I, if, if this were in a classroom, I can see why, why it would didn't fly. I can see why somebody would have to rip up that that list and start again. Uh, now, there's a line in your Miyahu takes us out of out of Kitty for a bit, but it's a fascinating line in your Miyahu that years ago when I first started noticing all these things, that line in your Miyahu was really what pulled it together for me, uh, because your Miyahu in chapter thirty one, uh, this is source eighteen on our source sheet. Uh, Yirmiyahu talks about he's talking about you know it actually it's actually in a in a part of Yirmiyahu right around referencing some stuff from uh, from right around this part of Torah, uh, but then they, 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 Yirmiyahu is in a difficult time. The Jewish people aren't really behaving well then, just sort of like kind of ego again. People are kind of doing idol worship. This is right leading up to the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash, which was a much worse outcome than just smashing some God made tablets at the bottom of the mountain that we can come back from. Uh, and then in the midst of talking about all the negatives and now all the people are going to be punished for all these horrible things going on uh, in chapter 31, Yermiyahu says, but you know what? It's not going to be bad forever. Days are coming. I'm going to make a new breed, a new covenant with the Jewish people. It's not going to be controversial if we think he's talking about the future, but I actually think he's talking about the past. Um, it's not the breed that I made with their parents when I held their hands to take them out of Egypt. That one, they broke, and I punished them for it right away. That sounds like this is talking about the Asterity brought, which is referred to as a breed. That's the covenant between us and Hashem. And right, sure enough, paint wasn't even dry on the, on the Luchot, on paint, you know, uh, carved Luchot. What, paint wasn't even dry on the Luchot before before the Jewish people broke that contract, they broke my covenant, and Hashem got mad at us and punished us for it. But rather, this is the covenant that I'm going to make with the Jewish people, or that I made with the Jewish people. After those days, I put my Torah in their midst, I'm going to write it in their hearts, meaning like, I'm going to find a way that speaks to them. Like so Going back to that idea of co-creating our class rules, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna co-create these rules with them. I'm gonna make it in a way that that they really feel into, that they feel engaged with. Um, then I will be their God, and they'll be my people. 
So how is God going to, or how did God make this, make this, this replacement covenant written on our hearts instead of the one that got ripped up, smashed at the bottom of Heart Sinai? So let's look at our our weird Twilight Zone Ten Commandments from Kitisa again, uh, which again we've got back on our source sheet sources two through eleven, or we've also got the references to it here. So number one. Don't make idols. So it's a bad start, rocky start. We don't want all these don'ts. Uh, but then we go into number two. Um, oh, Chagamatzot. Let's let's celebrate Pesach in springtime. You know when the when the grass is gr- growing and the flowers are flowers are blooming and the birds are singing in the trees. That's when we should have our holiday. Oh, hey, you know things are looking up. We're talking about a holiday. We're talking about the springtime. Number two, give Hashem your firstborns. Here's an opportunity to sacrifice to Hashem. And, you know, speaking of this whole co-creating, we know that the people want to sacrifice in Kitisa because what do they do as soon as they get that that golden calf? They say they get up early in the morning and they didn't even wait. They didn't even sleep in They're up Early in the morning, they're sacrificing to the cow. Not the best way to do things, but it's just like, okay, you want sacrifices? I'll give you sacrifices. Do them in the right way. Give them to me with your firstborn. Now that's what I call a sacrifice. And they want it. You want to give money? They gave out, donated all their gold to the... To, to make that cow made out of gold, yo, you want you want to you want to give money, you want to donate? I'll give you a donation. You can make redeem your firstborn sons, redeem your firstborn donkeys. There's the money you should be donating for a better cause. Number four, don't come empty-handed. Okay, don't appear before a bit of empty handed Okay, it's not, uh, not the not the best the best way we want to fr- uh, frame it, but okay. Uh, number five. Um. Number five, we've got Shabbat. Keep Shabbat. Rest on the... Now, what's interesting, if we look back at our uh, at our Yitra Ten Commandments, we have Shabbat, but like I said, it's it's this mix of do's and don'ts. Yeah, remember Shabbat, and then don't work, don't, then you can't work, they can't work, this person can't work, don't, 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 don't. But in Kitisa, if we look at how, how the commandment for Shabbat is given in Kitisa, uh, which is source six in the source sheet, um, 34, uh, 3421, okay, six days you work, you work, he spot. Telling us to rest, it doesn't say don't do work, it just says you should rest. So again, this is, this is how, this is how we reframe our, our class rules into positive language. Instead of saying, oh yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't work on Shabbat. Oh, good idea. How would we phrase it as take a rest from your work on Shabbat? You know that it doesn't say don't lo tacharosh. Doesn't say lo tikzor. You oh you know all that you know all the hard work you do with your your plowing and your harvesting. Take a rest from that on Shabbat. That's what you should do. Rest. Uh number number six. Uh three times a year you have holidays. You come to the Beit Hamikdash. You get to go on a little vacation, a little a little field trip from wherever you are. You come to the Beit Hamikdash. And again, you like those sacrifices that you were giving to that cow made out of gold, give the sacrifices to Hashem at the Beit HaMikdash in the right place that Hashem chose instead. That's what you should do. Number seven, oh, don't sacrifice chametz. Okay, we've got another don't there. No no chametz in the Mizbeach. Uh, number eight, no leftovers of Korban Pesach. Another don't, not great, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll come back to it. Number nine, bring your Bikurim. Again, you want, you want to give gifts? You want to give sacrifices? Great. Bring some first fruits. You want to eat and drink. You know, people were, were feasting, eating and drinking with the golden calf. Eat and drink at the Beit HaMikdash. Eat your Bikurim and your Rosh Hashanah. Uh, so again, we're, let's let's turn this, let's let's do some, some you know, student-centered, so to speak, uh, rules. Let's let's find the rules that really engage the Jewish people at this time in Kitisa. And number 10, okay, don't cook the goat in its mother's milk. We're going to have to come back to that one. Why is it another don't? But already our numbers are looking better. Back in... Was there, back in in Yitro, we had seven and a half don'ts and two and a half do's. Not great. Uh, now in Kitisa, and I'm going to say not great. I'm not knocking the Ten Commandments. I'm saying not great for this specific scenario where these people are already going off the off the derech and making a gold ca- a golden calf. Uh, but now in Kitisa, we've got one, two, three, four, five don'ts and five do's. It's even at least half and half is way already a way better ratio. Than than seven and a half to two and a half, and we're going to we're going to even it out a little more. Uh, now, first of all, 
uh, just doubling back here, we mentioned those original Ten Commandments were introduced with God spoke all these words. So that first one, one of those few do's that we actually had there, we can't have the I am Hashem one anymore. It doesn't work. It works as a mitzvah that we have in the Torah. It's still in there. The, all those mitzvot from each are still part of the Torah, but it can't be on the covenant. It can't be on these new luchot when those new luchot aren't being read out by, allowed by Hashem anymore. This one works because the people heard this directly from Hashem. Who's saying I'm Hashem? It's Hashem saying I'm Hashem. But these new luchot, okay, we had our chance of divine revelation. This one, Moshe is just going to teach it to the people. We don't want them getting confused with who Hashem is. That's the last thing we want after Chada Ego. So this is why this this for this first positive one has to be stricken from the list and you know what even the honor your parents i love my parents i'm happy to honor my parents but when people are already struggling with all these don'ts listen to the authority figures is maybe not the the one positive commandment we want to put on the list so let's let's leave off the lineup with the authority figures and find some better positive ones uh and looking at don't number one when we're saying hey we're off to a rocky start with this first number don't but don't number one is absolutely necessary as a response to Chet Egel. Because don't number one, we can read also from the sheet. Uh, it's on, uh, we've, uh, what does Hashem say? We've got on the right side of the page when the when the Jewish people are doing Chet Egel. When Hashem tells Moshe, hey Moshe, go back down the mountain. Uh, you got to hurry. You got to deal with this right now. Uh, who wants to read on the right side of the slide? Uh, Justin? Saru Maher min haderech asher tzivitim asu lahem egel masecha vayishtachavulo vayizbechulo vayomru ela elohecha Yisrael asher halucha me'eretz Mitzrayim. Thank you. So Hashem says the people have really turned away from this path. Like I said, they've really, they've gone off the derech really fast. Again, paint hasn't even dried. They have made an egel masecha. And I I'm again, I've got the Hebrew and the English. Everyone's got different language preferences, but I find the Hebrew is really striking here. So thank you for reading the Hebrew because we're going to egel masecha. What kind of egel? What kind of cow? Masecha. Here, uh, and the JPS that I took from Safari also translates it and say molten calf, whatever that means. And they, they made this egel masecha. They bowed down to it. They sacrificed to it. And they said, this is their God that took them out of Egypt, which we know is not the case. And what's our first commandment in Kitisa? Who wants to read on the left side of the screen? Ariella? Elohim asecha lo taselach. Thank you. So again, number one in Kitisa is don't make Elohim masecha for yourself. Don't make, again, JPS translates as molten. So it's not just a not just a generic don't of don't have other gods. Great, we had that in in Yitra and they already didn't listen. This is like don't do that thing that you just did with the Elohei Masecha. Don't make that. It's using that same word Masecha. There's a lot of words, and we saw in Parashat Yitra that commandment, second commandment of don't worship other gods was very long. It was that it used a lot of different words for uh almost every word except for that, for what you we can't make for other for idols. But here it's a very short line, five words, but it specifically pulls out the same word that was used for Chet Egel. Don't do that. That's wrong, but here's what you can do instead. So this don't is absolutely necessary. And then we saw it, it pulls us into the positives right after that with, okay, don't do that, but you can celebrate Pesach, but you can give Hashem your firstborns and redeem your firstborn sons. And then we've got a few more don'ts. What are we going to do about those? We've got, they're all about sacrifices, if you see. We've got, don't come empty-handed before God. Meaning, don't, you don't, yeah, don't come to Beit HaMikdash on those, on those holidays, on the Shulchan Rikalim, or other, other times that you're supposed to come to Beit HaMikdash. You can't just come and be like, oh, I'm just visiting. I, I you know, I'm in the, the Monopoly Square. I'm not in the jail. I have to pay $200 to get out. I'm just, I'm, I'm just visiting. I'm just, no, you don't come empty-handed to Beit HaMikdash. You do bring gifts and sacrifices. So, yeah, it's phrased as a don't. But it's a don't that leads into, you know, those sacrifices that you like doing that I saw you doing in an inappropriate way with Chada Egel. Here's how you should do them. You should do them at the Beit HaMikdash in the appropriate way as gifts to God. That's what you should do. You don't come up empty handed. Bring your sacrifices now. And again, with don't sacrifice chametz in the museum. Don't sacrifice chametz. 
but do bring those korban minchas of unleavened bread, the matzah and the pancakes and the, all the different types of matzah, fried in different ways, baked in different ways. Yeah, don't bring the chametz. Bring all that matzah instead. Do bring those those mincha sacrifices. Do bring the unleavened sacrifices to the to the Beta Mikdash. And again, don't have leftovers of your korban minchas. You know what that means? You got to eat it all that night. I love finishing things up night. You know, when you've got like, hey, we can't have leftovers. This, this is going to go bad. You've got it. You know that that last piece of cake. You can't save it for tomorrow. It doesn't last forever. It doesn't have preservatives. You've just got to eat it. I just take one for the team. I know, I know it's so hard to eat that last piece of cake. I was just like, oh, you can't have that la- leftover corn from Pesach. You know that you love that nice, juicy, barbecued lamb. Oh, such a shame. You can't have any leftovers. Guess you're going to have to have seconds on the Seder night. What a, what a hardship. You get to eat it all night. And again, with don't cook meat and milk, but you do. You know what you get to do? You get to cook. You get to cook meat. Meat. You get to cook milk. You get to have whichever one you want. You get to have a party. You know, just like you got, they were eating and drinking at Chada Egel. Yeah, you can eat. Yeah, you can drink. Don't do this separately. You got to, you know, have some some boundaries. Make sure you uh, take your time to eat. Make sure you t- check the clock, the three or the six or the one hours. Um, but you get to have each. So again, it's all of these, all the don'ts, other than the first one, which is, hey, don't do Chada Egel again. All the don'ts are focused on food, food and sacrifices. So it's like, hey, the way to a person's heart is through their stomach. Hey, what do you, okay, you don't do this, but you get to eat. Don't do this, but you get to eat. Don't do this, but you get to eat. So suddenly though, that list of don'ts is really, it's honestly, it's really one don't. And then yes, yes, it's like a half don't because a half and half and half, because it really is bring those sacrifices. Um, Yes, yes, half and half, half and half, yes half and half, which gives us, we had those original five, six, seven now. We've got seven seven do's to approximately three don'ts. Now that's a, we've totally flipped the ratio from Mitra and now we've got this overwhelmingly positive, easy to do, Ten Commandments. Now, again, we've got that, why do we need this new covenant? Because what happened to the original Ten Commandments? Whoops, they're broken at the bottom of the mountain. Now, I would argue, when we talk about why did Moshe smash those tablets, what's going on in his head, I would argue that it's a very deliberate choice. I would argue that Moshe sees, he sees the Egel, he sees the dancing, um, and he sees that this contract isn't going to work. I'm picturing, you know, in those like silly movies where somebody signed a contract that, they're, they're a little coerced into, and instead of arguing, okay, this contract is illegal because they were coerced into signing it, somebody has the clever idea, which I'm not a lawyer, but I'm sure wouldn't really stand up in a court of law today, of rip up the contract, and then look, there's no contract, you can't be bound by it. Uh, so Moshe did the exact same thing. He ripped up the contract. Moshe said, hey, Hashem, oh, you want to prosecute them for breaking that contract? that says don't have other gods and don't do this and don't do this and don't do this and they're breaking all of it? Whoops! I ripped up the contract! No more Lucha and Abri. Guess you can't prosecute God. We're going to have to start from scratch with the new contract and maybe this time let's make it a contract that they're actually able to keep. Now, the let's get back to where I was at. Um, the traditional says, to be clear, when we call this a new covenant, Yirmiyahu, if, if this is what Yirmiyahu is talking about, Yirmiyahu calls it a new covenant. It's not a new covenant. It's a new contract. The div- it's, it's new divrei habrit. But the breed itself is still the breed. We've still got, and to be clear, that breed between us and Hashem is the, it's the entire Torah. It's all of this relationship that we have. Those Aserah to Debrot are still in play. And we see on our social, we've got those Aserah to Debrot are repeated in Sefer Dvarim. And now I said, I was, Playing with things a little. When I said the ones in Kitisa, they're the first ones to be called the Seret HaDivarim or Dibrot. But in Va'etchanan, when we repeat the classic Ten Commandments that we all know and love, in Va'etchanan they are referred to, the classic ones, as a Seret HaDivarim. So those are also called the Ten Commandments. They still are the Ten Commandments. Divarim says so. But then again, these ones are also there. And in fact, before the contract got ripped up, before the smashing of the Luchot before the golden calf, we can see back in Shmot 23, we have a suspiciously similar set of commandments that look like the exact same ones we've got here in Kitisa. 
So we've got this parallel of, on the one hand, the original contract, where the contract was the Ten Commandments, the classic ones that we got it on, in Nitro. Now, the contract was the Ten Commandments, but the covenant that it represented was the entire Torah, which already included the commandments that we have here in Kitisa that first appeared in Parshat Mishpatim. And conversely, this new contract, after Moshe rips up the old one and says, whoops, yeah, they couldn't uphold it, but so what? There's no contract you can't prosecute. Uh, this new contract with from Kitisa, this new Aserah to Devarim, Divrei Habrit, the words of the covenant that represents our entire covenant with God, it still includes the entire Torah. It still includes, including those Ten Commandments that were ripped up. They're still in the Torah. They still get repeated in Devarim to be like, let reaffirm, just in case you're, in case you're wondering, this got ripped up. Is it not valid? Oh, it's still in play. It's still in the Torah. It's just not the words of the contract anymore. It's not the flagship. Um, the Torah is the same. The covenant is the same. But the change is the contract. Now we've got a contract that's worded in a way that the people of the time, the Jewish people of the Kitisa era, of the, who, just, who just got out of Chet Egel, in and out of Chet Egel, the, the contract that they're able to keep. Uh, so we've got we've got our Torah, hasn't changed. We've got our covenant, hasn't changed. But Moshe ripped up that contract and said, you know what, Hashem, we need a more, we need a more student-centered contract uh, for the, to, to be the rules posted on the wall that represent our whole relationship. Let's start with something easy. Let's start with something that they, that they can do, something they like, focus on those sacrifices, focus on the positive, and then we can ease them back into having, having it represent that whole covenant that we already have with the entire Torah, including the ones that they were having trouble with before. And we'll start with that reminder of, hey, don't do that. That that Chada'egal business was not okay, but here's here's something we can invest in instead. Here's the positive instead. So um, at this point, I am going to close my slideshow and take questions. I think I saw some questions in the chat. Let me find the chat. Justin, your hand up is for now or from before for, for reading? Sorry, that was from before. I'll get it down. Okay, no, no, fine. Just if, no, if nobody has a question, I'll ask a question. But if anybody has questions, I have a question. There you go. You're, you're, you're labeling give your firstborn to God as a positive. But I don't think most parents would view it as a positive. You mean give away my son that I just gave, spent nine months here in a difficult birth, and you're viewing that as a positive? Like, what kind of crazy God is this that wants my kid? You know, so, I don't view it as a positive. I view it as a as a as a as a great negative. I I accept that that critique. Uh, I'll say two things about that. First of all. In the strictest sense, I was using positive as in a do versus a don't. Like, does it start with a a positive command verb as opposed to a don't, a law, like a negative Okay, verb? don't keep your so kid positive, at home, you know? I mean, in, I, I think that's horrible. Of, positive in terms of its imperative rather than a don't. But also, uh, I was I was summarizing because I am paraphrasing a little too much because I was only so much room on a little slide to make, make the slide pretty and not overloaded with text. But if we look here at the actual commandment that it's referring to, it says um, it says that the first issue of your livestock you give to God. Okay, so yeah, your animal you give you have to give that firstborn cow, that firstborn sheep to God. The firstborn donkey you buy back, you redeem with a sheep, you trade in a sheep, you give God another sheep. And your firstborn sons, it specifically says Kol Bechor Benecha Tisdat. Doesn't it's no, there's no there's no talk of actually giving God your child. Don't worry. God says right away, yeah, the first ones belong to me, therefore you got to pay for them. So again, that goes into, is it really a positive? It's, it's a hardship, you have to give hand over the money, but there's no question that you're not keeping the child. You're definitely keeping the child. And again, we saw with Chata Egel, people were more than happy to hand over their money to make that cow. Everyone said, give me your gold. They said, yeah, then you can have my gold. Because when their people were more than happy to hand over their money for what they felt was a religious purpose. So here's Shem saying, you want, over, you want to hand over your money for religious purpose? Hand over your money to buy back your children. I want you to keep your children. You want to keep your children, so pay for them. And as a male, I object to being, or I'm uncomfortable being on a list that equates me with uh, animals. Well, 
You get to be bought back. The animals don't. <laughs> uh, I still object to it. I don't like being bought at the beginning of my life. Bought back, back uh, you know. Uh, this god is, does not hire a good PR firm. <laughs> Uh, Becky, well, I just want to, uh, according, I mean, uh, I feel about very interesting, very different, out of the box. But um, uh, according to this, so what? What was the? In other words, the first command, the first set of commands were given to be, to be broken. Is basically what you're saying. From I that mean, was, I, I, I think the first set of commandments that we get in Parshat Yitro are they're the authors reading, and it's still part of this incredible, div national divine revelation that we got from God. But I think. Uh, yeah, they were. It was a. It, it was we try in the like in the same way. Sometimes we make a set of rules, whether for a class or for an organization, for a group. And when we find, hey, these rules aren't working for us as written, we're going to need to think about how do we revise. And, the, and in fact, those first set of commands they're in play. They're still our rules, but it's it's a little intimidating to have that be the the, the list that's posted on the wall. We walk in. You know, you walk into a, a room in a new organization, you see the wall, don't do this, don't do this, no spitting, no kicking, no pulling. You're like, oh my God, what place did I just walk into? What are they like here? So like, okay, let's put, let's put a friendlier sign on the wall. They're all still in the rule book, but we've got a nicer looking sign on the wall. And, and, and you're basing it because the next Pasuk, after the 10th, one of these sort of new commandments, is um, the Pasuk, you know, you know, yeah. In other words, yeah. the following passage, you're saying very mele, that's what you said earlier, is these things, and you want to identify them as the Aserat had brought, kind of the, the new set of the Aserat had brought. Yeah, that, that's again, it's uh, again, it's not it's not like the the standard interpretation, no, but like looking at just a just a purely shot text based. It's the God says, write down these things, and these things are the Ten Commandments. So I say, okay, what are the ten things right before that line? It's these. Cool. Okay. Annie, I think you have a question. Yes, I'd like to know. Thank you. That was a very, very different kind of share. I like different things. I, I want to know if you want to comment on the difference between the two sets of the Luchot, the ones that Moshe smashed and then the second ones that he came down with, just in the way they were made. I always wondered what was the significance of the difference. So, Alexa, turn off. I think it's really interesting that you raised that. Well, the, luchot. So luchot. The, the original Luchot, as we mentioned, we saw in one of the sources, the original Luchot were written by God. It says, Elohim, written with the finger of God. They were personally inscribed by God. Um, whereas uh, the second set, God says, Hey, Moshe, carve these tablets, write into these tablets. So it's almost paralleling how that first, those first 10, God said them aloud to the Jewish people. They were authors reading, God said them, God wrote them. And again, that's why that first, that first one, number one in the Yitra one, doesn't work if Moshe wrote it. Saying, I am Hashem, only works if you really know who's saying I am Hashem, and that's coming from Hashem. Hashem wrote those words, I am Hashem, into that first, in that first set of tablets. Great. Second set of tablets, again, it can't have that I am Hashem line. Because it's going to be coming from Moshe. Moshe's the one writing down. We don't want Moshe writing I am Hashem into the tablets. We don't want people thinking Moshe's God and Moshe thinks he's God. That's going to give us a whole new Chate Egel problem. So those second tablets, Moshe wrote them. And they're rules that come from God, but me meant to be passed on by Moshe to the people. As opposed to the first set, which is basically a, a transcription of what Hashem said directly to the people. But at the same time, the second Luchot, and hey, now I, when I say second Luchot, now I mean Beth Khanan. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. way they're presented, um, that we assume that was written by by Moshe also. Yeah. Well, but again, in Ba'er Khanan, Moshe's like, hey, guys, remember when this happened? It's very it's very clearly framed as like a description of there was that event, and God said this, and you reacted, and here is what God said. God said, I am Hashem. Okay. But I so think when, that's when the difference. The loop, I think people, we don't want any confusion. I think there was a difference in the way the tablets were created, was it not? Was it not that Hashem carved out the first tablets and wrote them, whereas the second yeah. tablets? So it's, what it's, is this? It's the Torah goes back and forth. It says, Psalacha carved for you, but then it says that when God gave Moshe the tablets. So the Torah is like a little unclear for both sets who carved them, because in both times, Hashem first says, Oh, Moshe carved them. And then it's like, oh, Wait, God carved it for Moshe. 
But it is very clear that the first set, God carved the words into. And the second set, there's no indication that God wrote onto those second sets. No, this is... Thank you. I see in the chat any explanations of why a calf and not a bull. Um, so this is just going back to the wording. And I know other groups have different uh, translations when they're not going from the original Hebrew. But in Chet Egel, it's Egel, which is a calf. Uh, it's the baby cow. Uh, it could have looked like a bull. It could have been a bull calf, but it was a calf according to the text in the Hebrew. Um, as to why, I don't know. Maybe that's a question for our own and his smithing skills. Um, any other questions? Any other questions, comments? I mean, the AL Titan Tegla Arufa, but that's a whole other, other whole other shear. The connection between the Chet Egel and the Egel Rufa later on, but uh, for another time. If, I mean, I'm just thinking why it's an Egel, but of course yeah. you can ask why it's Egel Rufa. But for Salvation, you connected the, the Chet Egel with the Egel Rufa, that when you find a murdered body and you don't know who killed it, they have to bring in Egel, you know, the egg, and they have to chop it from the back of its head, the opposite of Shita. <laughs> And with Egel Arufa, they declare, hey, we're not guilty for this, sort of like how with the Chet Egel, everyone's like, hey, it's not my fault. Right. Yeah. Milton, you want to ask a, a uh, question? Set your hand up for now. I guess uh, two questions. Um, one, uh, it says, Vayom Hashem al Moshe, Psolcha, Shnei Luchot, Avanim, Karisonim, Chasavti, Al Haluchot, Et Avarim Asher Yual, Aluchot, Arisonim, Asher Shibarta. So I assume that Act, the actual words on the second tablet were the same as the first ones, and so, um, yeah, that that's a standard. That's a standard interpretation. Um, I'm I'm kind of playing on how God first says, "Yeah, I'll write these and I'll write what was on the before," but then suddenly in Parsha Kitisa, later on in 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 Perak Lamadalid, God says, "Okay, Moshe, write down all these things onto the Luchad." It's like, wait, didn't you think you were going to write it? Didn't you say you're going to write the things from before? So, like, it could be yeah. that, that that this line in Lama Dalit is just referring to not what we just read, but actually what we read earlier in Yitro. Or it could be that it's like, okay, you know, maybe there was some discussion of like, hey, God, you know, those that, that list of don'ts on the wall is kind of hard to swallow. Maybe that's why this happened. Uh, so then there's a bit of a discussion that ends up saying, okay, write these things. Yeah. Um, or yeah. this is a fanciful way to, to interpret those Ten Commandments that we read in. In yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, I noticed that there were a whole bunch of don'ts before the uh, do's that you mentioned. Um, in other words, it says, "Shmor lachas asher anokim tzav chayom hinini garish mi panach lasu amori vaknani achitiva vachitiva prizi vachivi vaivusi hishamer lachav pentechros brisul yosef haaret asher tabale apenyel makesh bekerbecha." Um, don't make um, covenants with uh, those who live in the land. Um, well, th then I guess it's a, this is a do kies b'chasav to tzotzun v'estanot zevos anshay beirun kilosis tachavel lekel leel acher. That's sort of like the second don't and the yeah. uh, and again pentecost bristle yosef aretz. Um, uh, 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 I guess these are don'ts, but they're couched as um, because this will happen. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't include. There's, there, yeah, there's that whole preamble of not intermarrying and not worshiping right. other gods, which I did. I didn't include in my count of the ten in Kitisa because it was part of this whole long preamble, and it didn't fit the math. So I felt that maybe it's not really a part of that same section. Although even if we rearrange the numbers and counted, like you said, it's like semantically it's conveying a negative but it's couched in all this positive he shamer pen it's not saying yeah. law don't not saying don't do the thing watch out so that you don't and then the he shamer becomes the positive so again it's like make sure you don't try not to uh because and you're gonna instead of saying don't sacrifice it says knock down those knock down this knock down that so again it's 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 what we would interpret in our minds as a negative but turns around to be written as a positive. So thank you for, for also drawing attention to that, that in that preamble in, in Lema Dalid. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, we'll say thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, 
creative uh, um, shear, and um, uh, we we'll look forward to learning with you in the future. Uh, tomorrow morning, of course, I continue my Seder shear. We're just about to hit Shimon Esri. We, we will, uh, so between Shimon and Shimon Esri, tomorrow at 9.15, uh, Rabbi Liebtag on Sunday, and uh, all our shear for next week. We should uh, hear good news, and want to wish everybody Shabbat Shalom, and uh, please invite a friend to join us, and um, we should uh, be well. And uh, thank you very much. Always nice to have Torontonians teaching it. I'll put in another plug, especially, you know, and uh, to mention, again, we're alumni of the same school, many years apart, but we're both graduates of Associated Hebrew Day School, which is, I guess, still the largest elementary school in Toronto, as uh, far as I know. And um, anyways, but uh, everybody, be well, Lila Tov, and thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Thank you.